Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement. And if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm going to show you how great I am. Who the heck does he think he is? On the campaign trail, Joe Biden ripped into the president over reports Mr. Trump dishonored fallen U.S. troops by calling them, quote, losers and suckers. If these statements are true, the president should humbly apologize to every gold star mother and father and every blue star family that he's denigrated and insulted. The Atlantic magazine cites four unnamed White House sources who say President Trump canceled a 2018 visit to honor American war dead at a cemetery outside Paris because he was worried his hair would become disheveled in the rain, telling senior staff members, quote, why should I go to that cemetery? It's filled with losers. On the same trip, the article claims Mr. Trump referred to the 1,800 Marines killed in a major World War I battle as, quote unquote, suckers for their ultimate sacrifice. I'm not saying the military is in love with me. The soldiers are. The top people in the Pentagon probably aren't because they want to do nothing but fight wars so that all of those wonderful companies that make the bombs and make the planes and make everything else stay happy. Hi, once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner, and welcome into a special edition of The Man in the Arena. A reminder, once again, for those of you watching us live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, that when the show is over, you can watch it again. All you have to do is go to welcometothearena.com. You can download the episodes there, and the audio will be available on nine of the popular audio podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google Play Music, Spreaker, Spotify, and so many more. We invite you to catch the shows there. Pass them on, and please subscribe if you will. The American military is under attack, not just from foreign forces, but from within, from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Things being said and allegedly being said by the President of the United States. But there is more to it than just that. It is the rank and file of the military that is coming under question by a number of people who look at the individuals that are not just in the military, but then getting the training and what they are doing with that training once they are out of the United States Armed Forces. We speak of white supremacy, which is an issue that, quite frankly, many people don't want to discuss, but it is there. And the American military may not be doing a good enough job of ferreting out those who are using the United States military for their nefarious schemes once their tenure is done. We begin, of course, on the political side of things, because what is happening with the military is certainly being drawn to attention right now with comments from the President of the United States. What better than to ask than somebody who has been there, not somebody who merely covers the military or not somebody who simply looks into what happens in the Pentagon, but somebody who knows the workings inside and out. Our guest here today is a retired U.S. Army Colonel. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy. He served in a command and staff positions in both the U.S. and the European theaters during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, don't forget the Kosovo crisis as well. He is a former dean of academics at the United States War College, and he is an individual that believes strongly in leadership, quite frankly. And it's something that we've talked about in many ways, and we're going to talk about here today. His new book is called Battle Tested, Gettysburg Leadership Lessons for 21st Century Leaders. And it is that leadership we will talk about and what it means from the top, and how it gets right down to the bottom. As we welcome in Colonel Jeff McCausland, joins us today on The Man in the Arena. Colonel, thanks so much for being here. It is very good to be with you. Colonel, let's first talk about what we heard coming into this show right now, and let's get to the news of the day, I guess you will, and it has been the news of the week. The President of the United States allegedly making comments, which have been reported by The Atlantic Magazine, confirmed by a number of other media sources. Before we get to what he has said about the Pentagon in recent days, let's deal with that. 
And I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment here right at the top because people say that the media is biased. I'm not going to be that because I'm going to ask from the other side. Why should we believe it? The president says I never said it, yet there are people out there, supposedly high-ranking officials within the White House and maybe other military sources as well, who say he did use the words suckers and losers. So why should the American public believe it? Well, I think you're actually exactly right. And of course, we've had this controversy over what's true and what's false in the media. It's been going on for a number of years. Why would you believe this is true? Well, based on, it seems to me at least, in an article I wrote, it seems to me somewhat consistent with Mr. Trump's track record and things he's done in the past. I mean, obviously, we all know that Mr. Trump was not did not serve in the military, widely believed that his father assisted in getting a medical report that he would not be drafted for bone spurs. He subsequently, in an interview in 1997, actually bragged that uh, his Vietnam had been avoiding uh, sexually transmitted diseases in New York during the 1960s and 1970s. Even prior to his election, he had been very critical, in particular, of someone held in high esteem by the military, that being the late Senator John McCain, and had referred to McCain as a loser on a number of occasions, also said he was not a war hero. It's interesting, of late, the president said, well, I never said that about him being a loser, but there's actual videotape that you can look at. Uh, Mr. Trump also called President George Herbert Walker Bush a loser uh, because he was shot down during combat in the Pacific back in the Second World War. In a meeting in 2017 in the Pentagon, uh, the president is widely reported to have called the senior service chiefs uh, all losers, babies, etc. And in that meeting and afterwards, as many believe, the moment when then Secretary of State Tillerson referred to the president as a moron. Of course, Tillerson then subsequently uh, left office. And we have also had reports of the president questioning why do we pursue uh, missing in action? Why does the government spend money on those people? They kind of got what they deserved. Other reports have the president has said for certain White House events that he didn't want uh, wounded people present from Walter Reed, those who particularly were missing limbs because he said, quote unquote, uh, no one wants to see that. So you add all those things and a number of others up, and then we come to the event, which is one of the centerpieces of the Atlantic article, which is back in 2018, when the president was in France for the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. There was bad weather, and they couldn't fly him to a ceremony at a, cer at a cemetery where American dead from World War I are buried. Uh, so he decided not to go, but it's reported by those officials that you mentioned uh, that he said, why would you go there? Those guys were losers and suckers. But subsequently, his chief of staff, retired General Kelly, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, did go to the cemetery by car, as did the leaders of France uh, and Germany, who also visited cemeteries on that day. But again, the president could not fly. And again, the Atlantic article says it was because he was concerned about getting his hair, hair messed up. So that kind of would suggest why that one might believe it. But it seems to me, at least now, because of the disagreements and that because one side said he did and many people now on the other side saying it's a hoax to include the president, it's very important that those officers in particular who were working very closely in the White House, like General Kelly as chief of staff, like General Dunford, who was chairman, like General Mattis, who was secretary of defense, or like H.R. McMaster, an old friend of mine who I served in combat with, who uh, was former national security advisor, come out and speak directly about what they know about that incident, these other incidents, and how they believe the president views his military. Is there any doubt whatsoever in your mind, and obviously you have spoken to a number of friends, you've mentioned those that you know very well, you're very tight within the Bellway community, you certainly have been around the Pentagon before, you know many of these military officials, but then any doubt in your mind whatsoever that the military themselves has no faith in this president and that feels without question that they are the, they're the kicking stone, if you will, of this president. And quite frankly, they're angry. The president says they love me, but you get the feeling that they don't if you talk to them real deeply, that they know what this man thinks of them. Well, of course, it's always a mistake to generalize about any group. And the, and the military is certainly a very large group of million plus people in uniform and half a million or more uh, government civilians in the Department of Defense. So generalizing about them uh, is uh, always fraught with potential errors. Those you speak it's, with, though, the people that you know. 
the people I know, the people I speak with, uh, widely find this offensive, widely based on that track record I described, believe that the president very likely uh, did, in fact, say these things. But beyond that, the Military Times just did a uh, survey of people of all ranks, officers, NCOs, as well as enlisted. And what you got from that particular survey was that there has now been a dramatic shift in the military to support away from the president. When he was elected back in 2016, clearly there was no doubt that then candidate Trump enjoyed much stronger support in the military uh, than his, his opponent, Hillary Clinton. The most recent poll suggests actually Mr. Biden has more support than Mr. Trump, that that has moved away. Now, again, we all know that polls can be subject to errors, but that certainly seems to be a significant trend uh, and to means to me underscore something we used to say uh, back when I was an officer amongst officers and NCOs, that you can't BS the troops. The troops want to know one thing, and that is, do my leaders have my back? That's what they want to know. And you can't BS them. And when they begin to think that they don't have their back, then you'll start seeing their loyalty shifting away. The president frequently argues, and you'll hear him say it all the time. Well, I've increased defense spending. I have increased military pay. I've improved the VA. And that's all true. Those have occurred under his watch. Those, I would argue they're exaggerated. Most of those things began uh, with his predecessor and were carried forward by him. But be that as it may, he has sustained those things. But in the military culture, you can't just buy people's loyalty. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines aren't just employees of the chief executive, the president. They're, they're the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States. They don't swear an oath to the president. They swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States, and they expect to be supported in that fashion for the service that they give the country. Colonel, what possibly could be the president's endgame? by continuing to insult the military, the use of the word losers and suckers, and discussing the Pentagon being involved in war profiteering, what possibly could he hope to gain? You know, that's a really good question. I think you have to get a political expert on as opposed to a military guy like me, Ed, because it doesn't seem I'll to be- I'll go with the military guys, believe me. I'm from a military family. I'll trust you guys any day of the week. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's really a political question because this particular campaign, this is the last thing the president wants to talk about. This is the last thing he wants people lined up to say, you know, and I never heard the president say this. Imagine right now that you're a senior Republican in the House or the Senate. How do you like being stopped in the hallways of the Capitol by reporters asking your opinion on these comments by the president? I mean, let's face it, they'd rather have a root canal than have that happen to them. So they don't want to do that. So in political terms right now, it seems to me the president and his campaign want to talk about anything but this particular story, but when the president comes out, as you suggest he did, and he surely did the other day, and said, well, you know, the soldiers still love me, but the senior leadership of the military does not because uh, they want to fight wars and they want, you know, they want to keep the defense companies happy. Oh, by the way, all those leaders in the military, uniformed and non-uniformed, are now people that were appointed by Mr. Trump. Oh, by the way, Mr. Trump has bragged throughout his tenure about increasing spending on companies and buying more aircraft and nuclear weapons and submarines as a matter of economic improvement. Oh, by the way, Mr. Trump is also the guy who has bragged about the great arms deals that he has done as an improvement to the American economy, to Saudi Arabia, India, and other countries around the world. So there's a certain inconsistency in trying to accuse the Pentagon. And oh, by the way, if you check out those senior officers of each service, who he says want to fight wars, if you check their right sleeve, you'll see the hash marks for the months they've served in combat. If you look at General Milley, the chairman, you'd see a guy who spent three or four years of his life in combat zones. And I can tell you, being a combat veteran, if you spend time in combat zones, you really don't want to fight any more wars. That's a good point, because I want to get to, again, the devil's advocate side of things. Because... In the 60s, it was always the military machine wanted to create as much war as possible because they wanted the money. They wanted to go to war. They wanted to use all of that ability that they could to wage war in the, in the wake of World War II, the Korean War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so many others. But now we have that, that same thinking process that's coming from the president, that the military just can't wait to get involved in war and just can't wait to get out there and kill people. What's the reality? 
of those generals at the Pentagon, in your opinion, who lead those troops and who get involved in what you just discussed, that the horror that is war and the men and women who come home in body bags? Body bags or come home severely wounded, severely maimed. You know, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the ratio has stayed constant for the last almost 20 years. For every soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine killed in combat, there are eight wounded. So if you have 4,500, as we've had, killed in action in Iraq, you've got 35,000 wounded, many of them grievously wounded, missing limbs, badly burned, and many beyond that number suffering the terrors of post-traumatic stress syndrome. One of those was my nephew, a young captain who served in Afghanistan and Iraq. He was hit by an IED in Afghanistan, lost a good portion of his hearing, but suffered grievous mental problems from PTSD, was mentally discharged, and we buried him about three years ago. He was one of those uncounted casualties, one of those uncounted killed in action. So this particular generation of senior officers, I would say at this point, are reluctant warriors. They've buried too many soldiers. They've been to too many funerals. They stood at Dover Air Force Base and saw the caskets carried off the planes as guys came back. They visited Walter Reed too many times. I know, I, I just in general don't buy that. Now, would you find the officer or the NCO here or there who wants to pump his chest and tell you about how he likes being in combat? Sure. And we saw a SEAL who was court-martialed and then the, the president interfered in that court-martial, oh, by the way, who seemed to be of that vein. Uh, but I would call them a distinct minority. And frankly, I would call them people that actually need mental evaluations. How insulting is it to you as a veteran and as someone whose family has been touched by death because of American involvement in wars to hear not just the charge that the leaders are war profiteering, that they are warmongers, and that also you're a bunch of losers and suckers? Well, as a professional military officer who spent 34 years in uniform, I find that first one about us wanting to fight wars and make money personally grossly offensive, particularly for the reasons I said that the president has bragged about military sales <clears throat> on numerous occasions as a part of the economic portion. In terms of referring to people who have been killed in action as losers and suckers, I'll put it to you this way. My parents were married in 1944. My father left on a liberty ship shortly thereafter. And a few months after that, my mom gets a telegram that his ship had been sunk by a torpedo and he was missing in action. Now, obviously, he was recovered. I wouldn't be on this interview right now. And about the same time, she got a second telegram that her younger brother's bomber had crashed returning from a bombing raid in the Pacific, and he was the only survivor that was very badly wounded. In 1950, her younger brother was a Marine at Chosin Reservoir in Korea during the Korean War and was wounded several times. In 1969, my older brother went to Vietnam in 1990, I went in command of a battalion during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And then she had to say goodbye to her grandson as he went off to Iraq and Afghanistan. My mom went through what is the most terrible thing, I think, for every parent to do. And that is hug their spouse, a sibling, a child, and a grandchild as they send them off to war, knowing full well that they may never see them again. I can't imagine, frankly. My dad was in the military, but it was never at that point. I cannot imagine what that is like. And as a member of a military family, I'm insulted myself on a daily basis when I consider what is being said. So I can only imagine what it's like for someone who's experienced that from your perspective. Let us then turn then to the global scheme of things, if you will. Because while we have a president who is here scurrilously insulting his own military, with claims of war profiteering amongst those who lead at the Pentagon, we have still the international concept of what the American military is and what America now stands for under this president, in your opinion, and from those you speak with. How has the worldview of America changed in a military sense because this president tells us that we are bigger, greater, faster, better than anybody has ever been in the history of the world, Yet I get the feeling that if you were to hear it from overseas commanders and those in a in a leadership sense, you'd get a very different story. That's very true. I think uh, you have to remember the United States has troops in about 150 countries right now around the world. We are without a doubt a global power. 
I know this country several ways I've served in. I think we do a, a damn good job in terms of working with our allies, with the host nation, and the respect and admiration, I think, of the American military is pretty strong in those foreign countries. Um, today is the 75th anniversary of the arrival of American troops in Korea. 75 years later, we're still there. And if you take polls of Koreans, they have respect for the American military by and large. That being said, I think our allies are worried about having an administration that either A, they're not sure they can depend on, or B, they're not quite sure what they're gonna do next because it seems to be pretty doggone erratic. The president, for example, recently announced a one third reduction in US forces from Germany. Now you can make all kinds of arguments about that, which some of which are definitely valid, that the troops are not necessarily needed there as much as they were at one time, that's fair. You can criticize the Germans for not spending as much money on defense as they should, that's fair, and many senior Germans would agree with you. But the way it was done, which was a very sudden announcement by the president, surprising the Pentagon, surprising the Germans, et cetera, it's just done in a fashion that's not thought through and was largely believed to be done because the president was irritated with Mrs. Merkel, who's been a critic of his because she refused to attend the G7 meeting because of the pandemic and that meeting then dissolved. And so it was really more his personal uh, animosity towards her and I think trying to appeal politically now during election campaign to his base that I'm doing what I said, bring troops home. And that's what brought this all about. Well, that causes our European allies in general to say, does the United States stand behind us? You know what I said about a soldier always wanting to know, sure. does my leader have my back? You know, your allies want to know that too. Do the, do the Koreans, the South Koreans, when they hear that happens in Germany, do they say we can depend on the Americans? What do they think about that? How does that reverberate in Iraq? How does that reverberate in Afghanistan or to any ally? You know, during World War II, Winston Churchill once said, the only thing worse than fighting a war with allies is fighting a war without allies. And one of the great strengths of the United States for the last 75 years is the allies we have around the world. If you look at some of our principal protagonists right at the moment, Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, how many allies do they have? Well, I guess you could say Russia has Syria, congratulations, as an ally. China has North Korea as an ally, congratulations. Uh, the Russians have Belarus right at the moment. Okay, that'll do you a lot of good. But the United States has this belt of allies all around the world, which are one of our great strengths as we deal with not only military problems, but economic, informational, uh, in, and other major problems that we face around the world. And they look at us as well and wonder, how are we going to do, what are we going to do? And there's no doubt in any poll you look at internationally, the opinion of the world about the United States has suffered over the last four years. Is the opinion now that America can't be trusted? I wouldn't say that just yet. I would say there is a certain reservation or concern, which if it's not brought to a rest over time, could erode and we could see nations making individual choices that move that in that particular direction. It's just a matter of which way would you like that to go? Back again to that decision suddenly to pull troops out of Russia, out of Germany. One of my rules in terms of American foreign policy and national security policy right now is don't do anything that Vladimir Putin likes. That seems to me a pretty simple rule to apply. And I guarantee you the people in the Kremlin were celebrating when the president announced that 12,000 soldiers were leaving Germany very suddenly because they knew it would weaken the NATO alliance, which is one of their primary objectives. If you were then to look ahead, before we move on to something else here, but I'm gonna get your opinion here as someone who's been involved with the National Security Council, you've been involved in wars, you've been involved in operations. As you look at the global sphere of the theater, if you will, and all the various possibilities that are sitting out there. Hell, when I was a kid, it was always worry about the Russians. Then it was worry about the Chinese. And then it was worried about the North Koreans. And then it's worry about everybody else. Who worries you the most on the international scheme? Probably what worries me the most on the international scheme probably would be, first of all, global terrorism, because you don't know what they could conduct. And you know that the possibility of an attack could occur. And that attack could be either a massive informational attack, a massive cyber attack or something involving you know, a dirty weapon, which would cause local damage, which would be grievous, but cause unknown terror in the population. So putting that to one side, in terms of state actors, probably North Korea, 
simply because they're so unpredictable. And as one very close friend of mine, who's a North Korean expert, once said, you know, we probably know more about, about black holes in the galaxy than we know about what actually goes on in Pyongyang, North Korea, on a daily basis. It's a very opaque place. Uh, many people think that the Chinese have dramatic control. In my opinion, they have less control than you might imagine. And then finally, I worry about, I guess, what I would call the inadvertent conflict. You know, most wars started when people didn't really want them to occur. hundred years ago, World War I started, and I'm sure none of those leaders thought a war was going to happen. But inadvertent conflict is a great concern. When you have a lot of military hardware, like we do right now, off the coast of Iran, one plane bumps into another, one ship bumps into another, somebody gets in somebody else's airspace, and suddenly this can ratchet out of control. And we've seen that happen over time. The same is true potentially if you go to a place like the Taiwan Straits where the United States conducts exercise regularly to underscore our insistence on freedom of navigation, which the Chinese find irritating. And then last but not least, you always have to be concerned about the Russians because just based on capability, uh, the Russians still maintain a nuclear stockpile of strategic weapons equal to our own, signed under the New START agreement. So they're the one country based on that capability that could literally destroy the United States. Now, we would destroy them too, but it would hardly be a victory that anybody would want to celebrate when it was over. I want to look internally now then, if you will, Colonel, because we've touched on everything that we've heard recently about the military and the attacks from the president and others as well. But what actually caught my attention when I first got a hold of you was after seeing a couple of specials that were produced by Frontline and ProPublica and others where they talked about white supremacy. And if you watch these, and it, they're brilliant documentaries, one of them is about Charlottesville, and another follows up on Charlottesville. And it makes a direct connection between white supremacy in the United States, the rise of it, and also those who are in the military now and those who emerge from the U.S. military who have been trained and who take that training to a white supremacy standing, if you will, and become the national terrorists that I think we probably should fear a lot more than we currently do. I want to give everybody here a listen to an NBC News report, which was created earlier this year, produced earlier this year, if you will, that talked a little bit about one soldier and one event and one issue. And it's frightening to think of what one person can take forward and the havoc that they can create as a member of the U.S. military. Listen up. The FBI and the Army considers this extremely serious, and the soldier who's been arrested here faces a potential life in prison uh, if he's convicted, a sentence of life in prison. His name is uh, Ethan Phelan Melzer. He's 22 years old from Louisville, Kentucky. He's an Army private. He joined the Army in 2018, and according to criminal uh, charges that have been filed in New York, he began to communicate on a website that's known to be used by followers of an obscure, fringy, uh, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, satanic group called the Order of the Nine Angles, uh, O9A, and an, another group that uh, followed this. And they say based on his own racism and his own hatred, he began to discuss on this uh, chat room that he was in a military unit in Italy that would soon be deploying to Turkey and uh, in essence said, I'm going to tell you when we're going to go there so that, it, so that you can arrange for jihadists to attack our unit when we're on the way to a military base in Turkey. Now, the uh, FBI then began to talk with him, uh, a, a confidential informant, someone he was communicating with that he did not realize was working with the FBI and they began to discuss these details in a, in a sort of message-to-message -message situation. Mm -hmm. And finally, he was arrested on June 10th. And according to these court documents, uh, the FBI says that he confessed and admitted that he did all of this. So he's been charged. Uh, he'll, he's come back to New York. And he was uh, facing charges today, will be facing charges in uh, federal court in Manhattan. Colonel McCausland, Colonel McCausland. wrote about this not long ago for NBC News, where you talked specifically about the rise of neo-Nazis, white supremacy, white supremacists within the U.S. military, and the fact that the government itself, the military, doesn't seem to be taking this overtly seriously and certainly isn't doing everything they can to root them out from the bottom up. That's frightening. 
because especially when you consider not only are they getting the training, but they are involved in sensitive areas of communication. They are the people set to protect us, and this is much more rampant than we could ever believe. Yes, yeah, so I think that's true. I think you have to divide two things. They have to divide the government, what the government's doing about right-wing groups, of course, from the military. Now, they are, they are intertwined. Uh, but uh, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of right-wing groups in the United States uh, since about the turn of the century. Uh, some people even believe that was accelerated, and certainly the numbers would suggest, after the United States elected an African-American president. That perhaps was one of the, one of the reactions amongst one of the, many of the population. You know, historically, if you go back to right-wing nationalism in the United States, you really find it begins in the aftermath of the American Civil War, Ku Klux Klan being organized by former officers in the Confederate Army, most of whom, if not all, had been officers in the Federal Army prior to the war and, and reaches a high point in the 19, in the early part of the 20th century. And you can still see films of massive parades of the Ku Klux Klan down Pennsylvania. At the military at that time, uh, there were organized groups of Klansmen within the military. One battleship, for example, I won't defame the ship here publicly, but one battleship had an active chapter of the Ku Klux Klan aboard and would take photographs on the main deck of all the Klansmen all, uh, all, all in, a, in a group. And we've seen that ebb and flow throughout, throughout the history of our country uh, since that particular time. People forget that the most egregious, biggest terrorist attack on U.S. soil in the 20th century was, of course, the bombing of the Murrow Building in Oklahoma City back in 1995, mm -hmm. yep. which was committed by a former soldier who be, had been radicalized on a, in right-wing ways and committed those particular attacks. And since 2000, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of soldiers that we believe have been affiliated with this. But it's a very difficult problem for the military to deal with. On the one hand, how do you screen people in advance for enlistment? Obviously, I can screen you. Are you tall enough? Are you are you overweight? Can you do so many push-ups? Can you pass a test? We can do a background investigation with law enforcement, but that has to do primarily with have you been convicted of any crimes? We don't. We don't. We don't. It's not a crime to join these organizations. Most of all, it's only to commit a crime with these organizations that would then pop up on an official record. Any person who joins the military, does sign a document saying, have you ever been part of a group that espoused the overthrow of the United States? Well, in my 34 years in the Army, I, ever, I never met anybody who marked yes I've never seen anybody who's, who's checked off the yes box on something like that. No, I like haven't that. met them. I've never given you around, but I don't, I've never met them. <clears throat> um, so that, that becomes a difficult problem. But what since uh, 2000, what we've seen is we spent over $2 trillion focused on counterterrorism. But that's been primarily, if not exclusively, left-wing terrorism, Muslim, radical, jihadists being the primary focal point. There's been an effort, Homeland Security, about a year ago, published a report saying that right-wing nationalism was, was now the worst thing, that most, if not all, of the extremist-related murders in the United States are done by right-wing groups. But so far, that has, been, that has been forestalled in trying to come up with a better way to coordinate the efforts of Homeland Security of the federal government with local government in terms of providing them intelligence information, coordinate activities to deal with right-wing groups. And the White House has steadfastly even tried to push at the HLS uh, department that we don't even use the word domestic terrorist. They don't like to use that. And then recently, of course, many local governors and mayors have complained rather than coordinating activities, what we see is the showing up unannounced of federal agents and federal groups, which we think in times actually have made ongoing demonstrations more violent. Colonel, that's frightening when you think about it, because there you have the government itself basically saying, don't pay attention to it. How can they not pay attention to it? Because even from your article, and if you watch the documentaries and listen, it's growing in the country right now. How in the name of God can anybody look past this and say, it's not a big deal? We know that national-based terrorism, homegrown terrorists, are now one of the biggest issues that we have in America. So if you have that, why, why is someone not pushing this forward? And then what can you do at that point? You even talked about it. So you've got sources here and sources there. Homeland Security is looking. You have federal officials looking into it. You have police looking into it. But they're slipping through the cracks at an incredible rate. It, it seems as if something's got to be done drastically. But I, I'm going to throw that to you. What can be done? Well, the first thing I think we need to do is 
more broadly, there's the National Counterterrorism Strategy was published in 2008, I believe. But if you read that document, it focuses on left wing, counter jihadist, counter radical Islam. But if you look back at the history since 9-11, and we're about to pass here uh, in a few days, the 19th anniversary of all years. that. You know, honestly, we have not seen that many incidents. The incidents we have seen, and sadly, people have been killed. There is no two ways about that have been individuals by and large who were radicalized through the internet and committed isolated acts of violence on their own. That has occurred, yes. Have we had an organized effort by a group of people, uh, as we saw on 9-11, or by some other group to conduct an attack inside the United States? And the answer to that is, to the best of my knowledge, no. There are some people that still are looking into the investigation of the Saudi officer down in Florida, not far from where you're at, Ed, who conducted a killing there on the air base, or the naval base rather, whether or not some of his classmates were in fact involved. But they may have been knowledgeable. It does not seem like it was a, a group conspiracy. Now, if you're right, if you move on the right wing side, we have all these groups that are growing in numbers, whether you want to talk about the Boogaloo, the Proud Boys, Autumn Waffen, the Fourth Reich, and it goes on and on, Ku Klux Klan, it goes on and on, Aryan Nation. These groups are growing in number. And when a group of them show up, uh, at a particular rally, armed to the teeth, well, the possibility of violence seems pretty high. A gentleman from this group called the Patriots Prayer was shot and killed, I believe it was in Portland, Oregon, a week or so ago. Well, if you look at what's put out by Homeland Security, they will tell you that Patriots Prayer is a right-wing nationalist group that organizes itself, and when it shows up at events, it shows up at events well-armed, and violence almost always ensues. Uh, and that's and what many happened. of them have military training. And many of them have military training. And there is further evidence that in some of these groups actually have encouraged younger members of the group to join the military just to acquire the skills you talk about, not only in the use of weapons, but also in the use of explosives, of course. And in this day and age, of course, uh, many young soldiers also are trained in the use of uh, cyber warfare, which seems to me would be one of the main areas if I was running my right wing organization that I want, to, I want to make sure I had some experts in. So that is growing in number. The military, I think, is trying to do a better job of screening people, but it gets to, again, be difficult because what is the process whereby you screen people, number one? Right. How do you do that without totally violating their privacy, number two? Oh, by the way, number three, we are a professional, of course, which is recruited. And up until the pandemic, the economy was doing so well, the military found themselves in a real bind trying to attract recruits. So how, you know, uh, so how do you go about doing that? And then finally, what action do you take? I can take action against people who collectively do something which is a crime. I cannot take action against someone simply for joining an organization. When we're talking about these issues and you mentioned the invasion of privacy, are we getting to the point where because you are technically going to work for the United States and the United States government, where you are involved in a military sense, the protection of the United States, you can be called on any time, whether it be foreign or domestic, but because you're being handed so many of these, these intricate keys, if you will, to what could become the beginnings of terrorism, that you have to say to somebody, boy, here, I'm, I'm going to get in big trouble with the constitutional attorneys here right now, where I'm going to say, you don't have any privacy, buddy. I'm sorry, young lady, but when it comes to your privacy, we get to dig into anything we want at any time, because if you want to become a member of this of this military, then we have to dig deep. If you don't want to, fine, go on. The constitutional lawyers will scream at me. They're throwing things at the screen right now. But are we getting to the point where that's what we need to do? No, they won't be throwing things at you, Ed, because there's, I know as a commander throughout my career, there's two ways you can handle uh, discipline amongst soldiers. One is by legal action. You commit a crime, you steal something, you get drunk and disorderly, you're AWOL. Those are pretty clear cut and I take action. The second is administrative or regulatory. Now, if I'm going to give you a security clearance, so you have access to you know, classified material, or I'm going to train you on something which has certain classifications to it, and frankly, you cannot have a career in the military without a security clearance. If I'm going to give you a security clearance, then you have to accept the fact that I'm going to screen your background and I'm going to periodically rescreen your background so that in order for you to keep that clearance, every few years you have to be rescreened to make sure you haven't done something you know, totally wrong, 
you haven't gone deeply in debt, you're not taking drugs, you're not an alcoholic, whole host of reasons. And if I discover that you have violated what we lay out administratively, is required to maintain that security clearance, then I pull that particular clearance and frankly, your career is over. Or I tell you based on that particular review, we're not going to allow you to re-enlist. Lieutenant, and you, I think you uh, talked about him before, this Lieutenant down in the 18th Airborne Corps, uh, who posts these terrible things on TikTok. Okay? Which, as, which right. as you're talking about that here, I want everybody to hear exactly what he said. If you haven't heard it already, it only takes a couple Please. of seconds. But this was a TikTok video that he created. And we're not talking about somebody who's just a private in the military. We're talking about somebody who actually has high clearance in the military. Reason one million why I will never be verified. Dart jokes. Aha! Listen to this one. Why? What's a Jewish person's favorite uh, Pokemon character? Haha! <laughs> Ash. <laughs> and if you get offended, get the fuck out because it's a joke. Don't be a pussy! A second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Think about that first of all, and think the second thing is, he puts it out there for everybody to see. A bigger jackass, a bigger dummy you couldn't want if, if you tried. But if we had more like that, at least we'd be able to filter through them and find out just what we have involved. That is an absolute issue involved here. The anti-Semitism there is boiling over. But as yep. you said, and as we're talking, you can't find out about it. You can investigate all you want, but until somebody does something stupid, you think that they're towing the line. Yeah, and, and the command sergeant major of the Army, to, to name one person amongst many, came out and said there's no room for that in our particular military. It's interesting, I would tell you what also they did with that lieutenant, back to that regulatory part. His position in leadership was suspended, and his clearance was suspended. And I can tell you as a former battalion commander, his military career is over. And not only is his military career is over, I would hope that by denying him a security clearance, that will carry forward. And therefore, should he decide, and he will leave the military, to apply for a position with the federal government, he would be denied that job simply because as soon as they hit the flag that his security clearance was removed, he would not receive that employment. Yeah, so doesn't he can't it frighten do you, Colonel, things. that they're out there? Doesn't it, doesn't it really frighten you that those people are out oh, there? Oh, absolutely. There's, 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 there's probably, uh, I'm not going to get tens of thousands of them, there's several thousand of them out there right now as we speak. But, you know, you think about this, Ed. 2017, we had this terrible incident at Charlottesville, which you talked about in the front line piece. There were several military people. There was at least one Marine on there. I think there was one GI there. Administrative action, when they were discovered, was taken against them. But one of the interesting things back that, which kind of brings us back to this story of late of Mr. Trump, we all know the president at that time said, well, there were, there were good people on both sides. Nice there were people, good people yeah. on both sides. What people have forgotten is in the immediate aftermath of that, the senior military leadership, many of whom now the president saying are warmongers, the chief of every service, the chairman, chief of Army, staff, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, all sent messages out to the force. All of them said basically the same thing. No, there weren't good people on both sides. We do not tolerate that in our service, which to me was a really very interesting and shocking confrontation with the president only a few months into his presidency when they basically stood up and said, no, we don't dis we disagree. They didn't put it in quite those emphatic terms, but in essence saying, we disagree what the chief executive, the commander in chief just said. You mentioned the frontline ProPublica piece, which I alluded to. I want to invite everybody to stick around because as we close out the show, there is a short preview of that specific special regarding Charlottesville. And I heartily recommend that everybody find it. It is on the frontline page on the web. Also ProPublica is there as well. There are two fascinating documentaries that talk about this and it will frighten you to the level of which the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists are here in America. They are the biggest terrorist threat we have, and they are using the military in many ways to get ready for their crimes later on. Colonel, I know that you have things to do, and we are unfortunately out of time then, but I want to make sure that we come back and do this again because your expertise on the military is something that we need right now, quite frankly. And I'm, I'm going to say this again as, as, a, as a kid of a military family, I support the military wholeheartedly. Everybody makes mistakes every now and then, but we got to get behind our soldiers and we got to stop this 
this insulting of our soldiers, these terms like losers and suckers for men and women who put their lives on the line every single day. It's, it's frightening and it's insulting in many ways. I want to remind everybody that if you want to go ahead and get a hold of the colonel, first of all, a reminder of his book. It is called Battle Tested Gettysburg Leadership Lessons for 21st Century Leaders. Uh, it is now out. I believe it, it, uh, it just came out. Did not just a couple of days ago? Yep, last Wednesday on Amazon. Wednesday, last Wednesday on Amazon. You can make sure to pick it up there. There's the cover of the book. Look for it, please, because, I mean, I'm one of those people who always speaks about leadership. I'm going to be getting my copy. Trust me on that. And if you want to go ahead and get a hold of the colonel, you can get a hold of him on Twitter. It is M-C-C-A-U-S, McCaws L-J. It is at there on Twitter. If you want to find out... Uh, more about what he has done at the U.S. War College and many of his opinions there. You can also visit him on Facebook. That is at Jeffrey McCausland. Um, it's good to see that you've got all the ways in social media. I love when somebody's on top of all that. And for his email as well, it is McCaws lj at comcast.net you can get a hold of him there and i guarantee you we're going to have him on this show again because it's a fascinating conversation colonel thank you so much um i i say it i, I once had somebody say to me and i wanted to ask you this on the way out because i'm always fascinated to hear from former members of the military i've had people tell me don't tell me thank you for my service your service there are some military members who say you don't have to say that to me all the time that it's become something of a cliche how do you feel about that We'd have to talk an awful long time about that, Ed. <laughs> but by, by and large, uh, I, I, um, I do worry that it's become a good uh, cliche, almost like have a good day. Um, I prefer, you know, Dan Crenshaw, who's a SEAL, uh, once said that he doesn't like to say that. What he likes people to say is never forget. Whether you're talking about guys who were killed or wounded in, in, in uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, or back to those soldiers that the the ceremony and the cemetery outside of Paris was supposed to honor. I like never forget. Never. It's better forget. than if people, if, when you see someone in uniform, shake their hands, touch elbows now in the COVID-19 era and say, we will never forget. And they will yep. absolutely appreciate that. Colonel, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. We will talk again soon. The best of health to you and your family. Stay safe and uh, <laughs> stay healthy in this new world. Thanks, Ed. You as well. We'll have the colonel back on again sometime soon. A reminder, stick around because in just a couple of seconds, you're going to get a quick preview of that PBS ProPublica special, which I heartily recommend that you see. It's on Charlottesville. It follows up on that. It's about white supremacists, white supremacy in the United States, and it has that connection to the military as well. Don't forget, if you catch us live, go to welcometothearena.com. You can download the show there and also check out all of the major audio podcast platforms. You can download there as well the audio of this interview. Please subscribe and please join us and be part of the man in the arena. Thank you very much to the Colonel. Thank you to everybody here. And thank you. Until we meet again, rock on, true believers. I'm Ed Berliner. See you. Back in New York, our Adam Waffen source, John, agreed to talk over video chat with me and my colleague, Ollie Winston. So I'm Adam Waffen, Division 2, a Nazi extremist group seeking to spread terror. The main thing is lone wolf activity. When you say lone wolf attacks, it sounds to me like you're talking about basically terrorist acts. Yeah, they don't see themselves as terrorists, rather they see the United States as the ultimate terrorist. Like what Adolf Hitler said, how do you meet terrorism? You meet it with stronger terrorism. Adam Waffen is made up of about 60 guys, and then you have what is called initiates. That guys were in the process of becoming members, and in order to become a member, you have to prove yourself. So how many initiates would you say there, there are? Or were. Or were. Uh, when I left, there was more initiates than there were members. So that wow. tells you anything. All it takes is one guy to snap and to do something like that. That's what Dylan Roof said. I'm tired of saying nothing but in the white nationalist community, so I'm going to take a stand and I'm going to go into church and I'm going to kill all these black people because no one else is doing anything. That's, who knows, there could be another Dylan Roof and Adam Waffen.